Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Madeleine Britt, um, and I'm so excited to be with you all today, so thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to speak about the work that I did at Feeding America in Chicago, Illinois, um, specifically talking about how we anchor equity and inclusion in the food banking process. So first, just to give a brief synopsis as to the presentation today, the first is why do we lead with race? Why must we lead with race when we're talking about anti-poverty and anti-hunger work? Uh, second, what is the current diversity in the Feeding America network? Um, so looking at the span of 200 food banks across the country, um, what is the diversity in that, um, in that makeup? Thirdly, what is a race equity culture and why does it really matter in the conversations that we're having today? Um, fourth, what are some steps to committing to transformative change? And this is informed by some incredible anti-racist um, and racial equity groups across the country. Um, so these are not my steps, these are steps informed by those processes. Um, and finally, uh, time for questions and answers. So first thing, I want to start with some numbers that are incredibly important in this conversation. Um, first is that one in five African American households are considered food insecure. That's double the rate of uh, white households, which is one in 11 households. Um, so that is an incredible number to think about as we're talking about the importance um, and disparities um, when it comes to food insecurity. Um, food insecurity means that you have access to food, but it may not be the, the food that you are looking to eat. It has um, lower nutrition value, possibly, um, and it is not the first choice for you and your family. Um, the second number I want to show here is 9.1% of African American households are considered having very low food security, which means that um, at some point or another, you are um, not accessing the um, quantity of food that you need in a household. So again, that's uh, double the rate of white families in uh, the United States. And so those numbers are, are stark examples as to the disparities that you can also see here on the graph, which demonstrates a wide um, burden on communities of color. So you can see on the blue line that is African American households, and the orange line is the food insecurity of Hispanic uh, households. And that's almost double the line of, of white families. Um, this is something that I found during my time at Feeding America that I think is incredibly important um, and isn't often talked about. So this was a report that was done uh, through the Children's Health Watch, which demonstrates that the higher instances of uh, discrimination, or EOD, which is experiences of discrimination, has a direct correlation with food insecurity. So you'll see here that if you have three plus experiences of discrimination, you have 42% of those um, individuals are cited as um, having a child who's food insecure, right? There you will have 35% um, have a household that's food insecure. On the flip side, those households that are food secure, 52% um, of them have zero, um, chance, zero uh, instances of discrimination. So this is just an incredibly important, I'm gonna try to slow down because I talk quickly, this is an incredibly important thing to think about as we're going into different communities. And we, um, and I, I say this as a white person, we white people, right, talk about um, our role in nonprofits and our role in policy making. So if we are to look at the Feeding America network, again, that's 200 food banks across the country, 78% of executive staff are self-identified as white. And primarily those are white women, right? So understanding that the disproportionate impact of food insecurity is on people of color, um, under, it is important to think about this number, right? Because while that's the case, our partner organizations are primarily led by white folks and white women. Um, second to that, we have 50% uh, of warehouse workers identified as people of color, right? So there's a stark difference between those positions that have high leadership and have higher wages in the food banking system. So this matters for two reasons. Right? If you think about diversity, we understand that um, in leadership, it's incredibly important that management is representative of um, racial diversity because they're able to bring that unique perspective in um, understanding the racial barriers in securing food access. Right? So that is the importance of the first number. The second number is thinking about how food banks and nonprofits perpetuate, you know, very much likely not on purpose, um, systems of inequality and institutional racism, right? Because 55% of warehouse workers, that means that they're not accessing the pay that they need. Um, and so that's a, a wage disparity that exists. And finally, you see here that 50% of partner food banks report not having paid employees, uh, relying primarily on unpaid labor. So this conversation that we're having, when we think about how to build representation of people that are experiencing poverty in food banks, right? You may not be able to do that if it's unpaid. 
right? So that's a really important number to think about as we talk about the network that we're working in. So um, here is, we're gonna talk about building a race equity culture. And as I talked about in the beginning, right, I, um, this is a learning experience for me as a person who's worked in government, who's worked in nonprofits. And so this is uh, really built off of the learning that I have, have gone through in this process, um, primarily through an organization called GAIR, which all policymakers in the room, you know, GAIR is the Government Alliance on Racial Equity, which is an incredibly important partner in organizations being able to build a race equity culture in their um, agencies. So the first thing I want to point out is dominant culture, right? So dominant culture is where a lot of us are at. It's a lot, that's where we are as a society. It is where we are at as nonprofit organizations. Um, and what that does is, first off, it centers whiteness. It centers the white experience. It centers white um, comfortability. So it may or may not want to talk about race. It may or may not want to talk about, it doesn't want to talk about, sorry. <laughs> it doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, it doesn't want to talk about um, white supremacy. And specifically, it um, identifies assimilation as the priority over um, integration. And so this is important to think about as we talk about how we want to build a race equity culture. This is not the way to do it. Um, second to this is, and they go pretty much hand in hand, is transactional change approaches. So you're going to see a lot of nonprofit and government agencies taking on the issue of um, EDI in their workplaces. Um, but if it's done through a transactional approach, it's going to be very empty, right? So what that means is, is that it's based um, through confining power structures that exist. So we're gonna talk about race, but we don't wanna rock the boat, right? So that's, that's the big concern here. Um, a second thing to that is that we'll talk about race, but only for the individuals that are on you know, the, the, an equity team. We don't wanna talk about it um, if it's in the marketing department. We don't wanna talk about it if it's in the funding department. So that's incredibly important to think about. Um, second to that, it really restricts um, you know, the relationship between clients and the service provider. So race equity culture is what we're all trying to go for. Um, and the first thing to think about is race equity culture means that it's going to be critical to internal and external practices. That, uh, that criticalness will be a public critical point of view. It will not be internal. Um, it will adopt anti-racist policies in every department. So it will be deeply embedded in the current systems that exist throughout an organization. It's through transformative change that this is possible. So your organization cannot look or act or operate the same if you have a transformative um, type of change. So you want to ask that of the, uh, the people in that organization and not the CEO for that answer as to if that transformative change actually happened. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to speak about, um, and these are the steps that GARE really um, proposes as we do this work, um, is normalizing, organizing, and operationalizing. So how is this possible? Right? The first thing is normalizing, which is creating a shared value and language on anti-racism and equity practices. So some example action steps is administering a racial equity um, assessment organization-wide um, done by a third party, which is incredibly important in this process. Um, establishing a shared language so that everyone knows what white supremacy means, what racism means, what privilege means. Um, and creating an institutional racial equity mission statement informed by this process and informed by individuals who have the largest stake and impact um, in, the, in the organization itself and by client experience. The second is organizing. So how do you establish an intentional community empowered to implement these changes? Um, and that's done you know, through a multiple amount of action steps, but one is hiring a racial equity consultant, which Feeding America did, which is an incredible first step, um, and providing extensive training and development that lasts beyond two days, but really holds the organization accountable to what is happening on the ground of that organization um, and what um, you know, growth has happened. You can do this you know, through um, identifying a racial equity action team, which holds leadership accountable, um, is made up of primarily people with lived experience, um, and really you know, is given the tools and the resources necessary to be able to have a large impact on it. So it's not just there to say that we did it. Um, and then lastly, I'll talk about operationalizing. So center, centering anti-racism in all policy and procedural actions is critical, right? So um, this is the hardest step. It's very easy to bring in a uh, assessment uh, organization, it's very easy to bring in a trainer, but changing your policies and your practices is, is integral in this process. Um, and for white folks, it, it means talking about things that makes them uncomfortable. It means giving up power. Um, and it really relies on the fact that 
you know, a racial equity action plan is built into every single action in which that organization is taking on. And so one thing I will uh, leave off of, off on, excuse me, um, is something I passed around, which is a racial equity impact assessment. And this is really uh, a way in which an organization um, and in every department can ask who is being impacted by this particular policy. So for example, if you were to propose as the marketing department, um, or let's, let's say the funding department, um, a, a new uh, grantee, right? Um, or a, a new form of, of um, increasing revenue. How is that particular policy going to advance an anti-racist agenda, right? How is this particular policy going to negatively impact communities of color, whether they're within your organization or within the communities that you serve? Um, and so with all of that, I, I will take questions, but um, I again want to just thank the work that's happened through the Government Alliance on Racial Equity and um, you know, Race Forward that, that informed me of this process and I, oh, and yeah, welcome any questions. Thank you. So uh, the question was, if we are in an organization, please correct me if I'm wrong, if you're in an organization where there all are racist policies, how you might go about addressing those? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Um, or just individually as well. Like, someone says, oh, you did something racist. What's an appropriate response to that? Oh, to us you specifically. Know. Okay. Um, so one thing, so you're asking if, if we say, if someone says to us as a white person, you said something that's racist, how do we respond? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, so Robin D'Angelo does a really incredible job of uh, talking about this white fragility, right? As we think about how um, white people are, are afraid of being called out for their actions. And so one thing that she talks about, which I think is really important, um, is, is knowing, a, um, understanding a response, being ready for that, because the, the thought that all white people can never be racist, right, even if you think like you're really a, a person who like understands everything about race, right, that's not possible as a white person, right? So um, a few things that she, you know, kind of trains you in this, pro um, in her book is being able to say, um, I'm sorry, I will, uh, I will do better and, and learn about that. And I will uh, make the time to talk to other white folks and not ask people of color to explain what I just did was wrong, right? So that's a really important part of it, but um, I, I think that, you know, the, the question of white fragility is, is really about uh, white folks just being able to understand that they do have a, a role in um, self-educating and educating other white people, and that's a big part of that as well. Time is up, so I'm, I'm sorry. Robert, we can talk. <laughs> Thank you.